60 Minutes Rewind. Colonel Alexander Butterfield was commander of the U.S. Air Force's Tactical Reconnaissance Force in Vietnam in the 1960s. Later, he served as military assistant to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara during the Lyndon Johnson administration. He retired from the Air Force to take a job as a deputy assistant and secretary to the cabinet of President Richard Nixon. Shortly after Mr. Nixon's re-election, he was elevated by the president to head the Federal Aviation Administration. He served with distinction in each of those jobs, though his name was hardly a household word. And then, in July of 1973, Alexander Butterfield stunned this country when he told the Watergate Committee that Richard Nixon had tape-recorded conversations in the Oval Office and elsewhere in the White House. It was that revelation that eventually led to Richard Nixon's fall from power. Last Friday, Alexander Butterfield was back in the news when a retired Air Force Colonel, Fletcher Prouty, asserted that Butterfield had been, in effect, the CIA's man in the White House. Prouty said he had been told that by Watergate conspirator Howard Hunt. Since Prouty's allegation, Butterfield has been unavailable to the press. Tonight, for the first time, Butterfield, with his wife at his side, replies to those Prouty charges. The fact of the matter is, I never was assigned, I never was attached, I never have been their designated contact man. That is absolutely false. All right, he says that you were the CIA's contact man in the White House and that he was told that you were the CIA's contact man in the White House by Howard Hunt, mm -hmm. a former CIA agent, also one of the White House plumbers. He quotes mm -hmm. Hunt as saying, my contact there in the White House is Butterfield. Question, mm -hmm. did you know Howard Hunt? I have never met Howard Hunt in my life and I have never seen Howard Hunt in my lifetime. You mean up to and including now? Up to and including today. And as a matter of fact, yeah, Mr. That's right. Mr. Hunt's presence on the White House staff was kept from me. He was purposely kept off the rolls, and I had the official role of all members of the White House staff in my capacity as head of administration kept, in the White House. Kept from you by whom for what reason? Well, by Mr. Haldeman, who had. Uh, uh, jurisdiction over that and for what reason I have no idea but I've never seen Howard Hunt I don't know him at all and I did not know that he was on the White House staff and I was really supposed to be aware of all members of the White House staff I talked to Fletcher Prouty this morning he told me that he had not one but two luncheons with him and on both of those occasions he told it mm -hmm. uh, Hunt told Prouty that you were the guy in the White House if I was their contact man I was a hell of a poor one because I had no contact whatsoever with the CIA. He led reporters to at least discern a spy motive, or, you know, the word infiltration was used. Yes. And I resent that because that, that is as much as to say that I was at the White House to do at least a few things other than the things Mr. Nixon knew about or expected of me. And I think that's irresponsible. I think it's false. It's defamatory. And, and yes, you are damn right. I'm, you know, I am upset by that. And it comes a personal note here, it comes at a particularly bad time, it's right in the middle of a six-month period that I've set aside for myself to look for a position uh, in the private sector. You're, out of, the, a you're the, out of a job at this moment? Well, yes, I'm out of it. Well, I'm working as a consultant, a part-time consultant, as an interim measure, but, uh, you so know, the damage is done when those things are first said. Is it your intention to sue Fletcher <coughs> Prouty for libel? I think the grounds are there. Uh, he's, he's made a very serious allegation. He was careless in doing so, very careless with regard to his facts. So I, Did you have CIA clearance in the White House? I had CIA clearance. I worked outside the president's office. I was in charge of administration. I read everything that went to the president's desk. So I had to have a clearance for handling CIA material, which is not a big deal. It honestly isn't. Thousands of people have CIA Clarence, I have, I've had one in many of the, of the Air Force jobs I've had. You and Alexander Haig were both simultaneously on Robert McNamara's staff in the Pentagon at the time that President Johnson was President of the United States? For a short period, yes. Yeah, I sort of overlapped with Al Haig. I was Mr. McNamara's White House liaison officer replacing General Al Haig, Army. I was an Air Force officer. I see. And I came into that immediate office to work with the White House. and. Uh, were you ever assigned by, controlled by, 
employed by the CIA in any capacity during that time? No, very definitely not. No. Did you ever do anything, perform any chore, not on assignment from mm -hmm. the CIA, but in Air Force support? You were an Air Force colonel. But in Air Force support of a CIA undertaking, Mr. Butterfield. Well, I was, you know, I was in the intelligence gathering business when I commanded a reconnaissance unit in Southeast Asia. I commanded on three different occasions all the low-level and medium-level reconnaissance activities, U.S. Air Force reconnaissance activities Flying. in Southeast Asia. Flying, yeah. Flying squadron. Now, to the extent that uh, the CIA may have used some of the films and, and uh, used some of that data, then the CIA had something to do with that activity, but not, not to my knowledge. I never did deal with the CIA in any way. You were no. in charge of installing the taping system for President Nixon at the White House, the one that eventually brought him down. Right. right. I, I, would, I, gave, I was the intermediary who told the Secret Service to install it, okay. and that was the end of my... That taping uh, system was installed by the Secret Service, and one of the men in charge was Secret Service agent Al Wong. He was the man in charge, okay. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you know James McCord? at any time. Never. Never have met him or seen him to this day. James McCord, who was one of the men convicted mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Watergate episode. No, I don't, I don't know him. Al Wong, mm -hmm. who was in charge of putting in the taping system in the White House. That's right. Is a close friend of James McCord. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? I've read it since. I didn't know it at the time. And McCord, at the time that the White House tapes were put in, was still a member of the CIA. It is our information that the chances are very good that McCord was consulted by Wong, who doesn't have that te a technical capability or technical understanding, about the equipment and about the installation of the taping capability in the Nixon White House. That's pos possible, but, it, but it, uh, Wong was the chief of the technical security division of the Secret Service. I would think that he had the capability, but if he didn't, I... A United States senator has told me, Mr. Butterfield, that it's his belief that the CIA had, has copies of at least some of the White House tapes. And that indeed one of the reasons for President Nixon's failure not to destroy those tapes was that he knew that the CIA had copies, that there was somehow a feed from those White House tapes. I think that's, I don't, I don't believe that's the case. You know, anything could be the case, but I just, you know, there's so many, everyone's trying to make this thing appear so mysterious, and, and it wasn't at all. There was no facet of it that was mysterious, at least to my way of thinking. Are you sorry or happy it, that you blew the whistle on the tapes? Well, I don't like the term blow the whistle, because uh, that... That you told the that truth. That connotes uh, well, one who sort of did something in a sneaky fashion. I did nothing in a sneaky fashion. I feel very good about my role. I've never had any, I've never had any regrets about my role. You were fired from your job as head of the Federal Aviation Administration by President Ford. When? In uh, March 31st of 1975. I was there two years and two, two weeks. Right. Now we've heard er varying stories as to why you were fired. There are those who will even say that there was a vendetta against you in the Ford administration because you were the guy who, mm -hmm. forgive me, blew the whistle on the tapes. Mm -hmm. If President Fine. Ford wanted Alex out, that's his right, and I think Alex should have gone out. It, it was the method. It was the treatment yeah. uh, was from the for White it, House. From the White House, what? Yes, I felt that it was not straightforward. It was not, uh, I, I felt it was abusive. I know the language that was used. I know. Yeah. Uh, what language was used? Well, we can't use it here. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Well, now, it, that's, that, uh, you know, it doesn't serve any purpose anyway. Well, uh, language point. used by whom to whom? Just the treatment to Alex. I mean, uh... Well, naturally, she's probably... I'm, yeah, she's I'm mad. Wife, we were called and, and told that there was a meeting. The message was dump Butterfield. Mm -hmm. In the Nixon White House or the Ford White House? Well, in the Nixon White, White House right before the, the impeachment was But I, it, it was it definitely intimated to me by my friends at the White House, uh, whom I have many, uh, after Mr. Ford came in, that this, you know, it was, the move was still there. The, the, the same people were, and there are many, of course, that believe the whole thing was San Clemente directed, which I do, I honestly do. In fact, of course it is. Uh, that's, come on, let's, let's, let's be direct about it. What you well, I am. What I'm very direct. I don't uh, hold back on that at all. All right. You believe that, that for some reason, 
Mr. Nixon out in San Clemente was saying to Jerry Ford, look, mm -hmm. oh, get yeah. rid of Butterfield. Well, I think Al so Haig may have, may have relayed the message, but... Uh, what? I say Al Haig may have been the one to relay the message, but I think there were certain understandings there that, uh, uh, including the pardon and including some other things, and I, well, I'm, I'm sure of this. Mr. Butterfield, you were satisfied in your own mind that President Nixon knew about the Watergate break-in ahead of time. I said before the judiciary that nothing happened at that White House, and I do mean nothing, without the president's knowledge. And I think for something of that magnitude to have been scheduled as a break-in of the Democratic uh, headquarters, of course the president had to know about it. You mean the way the White House operated, it simply would not have happened unless Richard have been Nixon had known about it and said, Fantastically okay. out of character, uh, or. Uh, deviating from the modus operandi I knew of for him not to have known about it before. Now that's, you know, that is speculative. I've got to say that. I, I'm not, you know, that's the way I feel about it. The story will continue after this. Bob Haldeman once said to me uh, over at the Hay Adams Hotel that Richard Nixon was the weirdest man ever to sit in the White House. You knew him well. Well, let me, let me preface my, what I, my comment on that was something, too. There was, a, there, there was a greatness to Mr. Richard Nixon, beyond the shadow of a doubt, and he did a, a number of, of, of things that, that will go sure. down in history. And I, too, like Bob Haldeman, uh, admire him for some of those things. I think I respect him less than Bob. Uh, Bob said I respect and admire him, but he was, and he was, he was, he is strange, but that's his, his manner. He doesn't uh, uh, tolerate small talk or, and, but he's a, he's a, you know, a very fine man in many ways. He was very nice to me and my family, very nice to my daughter when, when she was in a very serious automobile accident. And not for any personal gain on his part. Right. And, uh, and having but said that. I must say that, uh, yes, having said that, I must say it made me sick at heart, really, when I learned about the, the corruption of principle that existed in, in, at the pinnacle of government. And there's a lot of it. I'm, there is a surprising lack of real honest to God, personal integrity in the higher levels of government. And I say that while recognizing there are a good many senators and representatives who, you know, who serve admirably well and who, who do have personal integrity, and people in the administration too. But there's a surprising lack of it. And I don't know when the country's gonna wake up to it. What's your feeling about all of this, uh, Mrs. Butterfield? Well, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a very private person, Mike. You know, I have never spoken in public, never spoken to press people, and but this last few days, I just, I am really sick and tired of rolling over and playing dead in the name of public service. And I have watched my husband, who I know and have known for 35 years, just dedicate his life to serving this country and these, the people of this country with courage and honor and integrity and I have watched this abuse of him over the last three years, and I am, have finally had it. And I think that the, in the end, it's not just personal, it's the American people are being shortchanged. Uh, he never thought of power, he never thought of money, he had never sought recognition. He wanted simply the satisfaction of serving his country. You know, I've finally reached the breaking point. I'd like to talk, because I'd, I'd like to, let the American people know that uh, maybe no simply devoted public servant can last in political Washington. 